Two suicide bombers and gunmen attacked crowds of Afghans flocking to Kabul's airport this last week. Thirteen U.S. service members were killed and 18 others injured. At least 90 Afghans were killed as well, perhaps another 140 wounded. President Biden addressed the nation. Speaking directly to those responsible for the attack, he said, We will not forgive. We will not forget. We will hunt you down and make you pay. I hope this was not said for political purposes and that he meant what he said. America's military is serving today in more than 150 countries on all seven continents. I've read that up to 200,000 women and men are actively deployed at any one time. Each took an oath to obey the orders of their commander-in-chief and their superior officers, even if those orders require them to risk or give their lives in combat. My father and his brother fought to defend America against the Nazis in World War II. They were first-generation Americans because my grandfather was a German immigrant who came to America in 1909 on his own. He was 16 years old. During World War I, Grandpa Musler took some heat because he spoke with a heavy German accent, but he didn't mind. He understood the sons of American mothers were dying in the trenches of Europe fighting Germans. Here's the point I do not want us to miss. Every U.S. soldier who died or was wounded this last week or ever in history chose to risk their lives to defend America and Americans. Last week's tragedy brings this fact home in a powerful and a poignant way we must not forget. I honor their memory and weep for their families. So the next time you say, God bless America, stop a moment and remember those who died to make that possible. Jesus died to save our eternal lives. This past week, 13 young soldiers died to save our way of living. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Pray with me, won't you? Father, Our hearts go out to the families of those 13 soldiers who lost their lives this last week in Afghanistan. Is it just coincidence that there were 13 original colonies in these United States that you inspired men to establish back in 1776? Are you reminding us of our heritage and your role in establishing a land of the free and the brave? I pray for the swift healing and full recovery of the 18 soldiers who were wounded. I pray for the families at home who have sacrificed much, giving up their loved ones to duty overseas and many now grieving their deaths. I ask that you comfort those who weep, Father. Give them the peace that surpasses understanding. And as for those Americans still there in that faraway land serving faithfully, I pray that you bring them home safely and soon and without further injury or loss of life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for praying with me. Today we wrap up our study of the judges who ruled Israel before they had a king. There were 15 of them altogether. Let's run through them. The first was Othniel. Scripture tells us that the anger of God burned against the Israelites because they had drifted into worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs. God then allowed them to fall into the hands of an enemy king. When Israel repented, God raised up Othniel to deliver them. He then ruled in peace for 40 years before his death, after which Israel fell back into worshiping the false gods of the peoples who lived among them. This is the cycle that repeats throughout the period of Judges. Ehud became the second judge of Israel. He was the left-handed man who used that left hand of his to draw the short sword strapped to his thigh under his clothing. He drove it into the belly of fat King Eglon of Moab, who had subjected the Israelites to terror and taxation for some 18 years. Ehud thrust the sword so forcefully, the Bible says, that King Eglon's fat closed over its handle. Shamgar was the third judge. He struck down 600 Philistines with an ox goad. 
That's interesting because an ox goat is not really a weapon. It's a tool, approximately eight feet long, fitted with an iron spike on the end. It was used to spur oxen as they plowed a field. Deborah was the fourth of the 15 judges and the only female. She was the prophetess who stepped up to become a warrior because her general refused to go into battle without her. Together they defeated the enemy and, after, Israel experienced another 40 years of peace. We discuss Gideon, the son of Joash, in some detail. The five tribes of the Midianites overran Israel and made their lives miserable for seven long years. God convinced Gideon to fight them after reducing his army to just 300 men. The Lord wanted to make sure that everyone knows it's he who fights our battles. In surprise attacks, Gideon led his 300 men and routed the Midianite superior army of 135,000 swordsmen. You recall that Gideon's cousins, the Jews from Ephraim, were peeved that they weren't invited to join them in the fight against Midian earlier. Gideon diplomatically eased their bruised feelings. Our harvest is gleanings compared to what you have accomplished, he told them. And then he continued on in battle without their help. When the war was won, the Midianites were destroyed and Israel once again experienced 40 years of peace. Gideon had many wives and 70 sons, but Abimelech was the son of Gideon's concubine, a woman kept apart from the others in Shechem. Abimelech became the sixth judge of Israel, but not by God's will. He seized power and assassinated all his half-brothers, the sons of Gideon, except for the youngest who escaped. Abimelech died after a woman dropped a millstone on his head and cracked his skull. He quickly called his armor bearer and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, or they'll say about me, a woman killed him. So his armor bearer thrust him through, and he died. Tola was the seventh judge of Israel. The Bible says simply that he led Israel 20 years before his death, but nothing more. Number eight was Jer of Gilead. He judged Israel for 22 years. Not much is said of him either. His only claim to fame was that he had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys and owned 30 cities in the land of Gilead. Jephthah became the ninth judge of Israel. When the Ammonites again threatened Israel, Jephthah made this vow to the Lord. If you will hand over the Ammonites to me, whatever comes out of the doors of my house to greet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites will belong to the Lord, and I will offer it as a burnt offering. I suppose we've all made stupid promises to the Lord at one time or another. This one was disastrous. God then proceeded to hand the evil Ammonites over to Jephthah and his army. After defeating them, when Jephthah went to his home in Mitzvah, there was his daughter coming out to meet him with tambourines and dancing. She was his only child. He had no other son or daughter besides her. This is tragic, of course, in part because his daughter said this, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me as you have said, for the Lord brought vengeance on your enemies. She requested just two months to roam the hills and to mourn with her girlfriends. But when she returned, Jephthah kept his vow. Jephthah led Israel as a judge for six years before he died. Ibsen was the tenth judge of Israel. He believed in mixing the blood of his children with Jews from outside his clan. Ibsa gave his daughters in marriage to men outside his tribe, and he brought back wives from outside his tribe for his son. Smart, considering the dangers associated with inbreeding, he judged Israel for seven years. Before there was an Elon Musk building a commercial enterprise to rocket people into space for profit, there was Elon the Zebulite, the 11th judge of Israel. We know almost nothing about him except that he judged Israel for 10 years. Abdon was the 12th judge of Israel. Not much is said about him either, other than that he had 40 sons and 30 grandsons who rode on 70 donkeys. Abdon judged Israel for eight years. Most of us know about Samson, the 13th judge of Israel. There's that business of him killing a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. I remember watching the Cecil B. DeMille movie, Samson and Delilah, on television late summer nights when I was a kid in the 1950s. The one with Hedy Lamarr and Victor Mature. 
torrid and steamy stuff. We sat before our zenith black and white and watched it together as a family. After all, it was a movie from the Bible. I remember it specifically because the word prostitute was mentioned, and I didn't know what that meant. I was five or six years old. I asked innocently, what does prostitute mean? No one responded. I thought no one heard me, so I asked again louder this time, Mom, what is a prostitute? <laughs> Mom said, and I will never forget the tone of her voice, Richie, it's a woman who does nasty things for money. I still wasn't sure what it meant, but from the tone of her voice, I could tell I shouldn't ask for clarification. Samson, of course, was a man blessed by God with superhuman strength. He was impulsive and childlike. When he fell asleep with the woman he was infatuated with, the one who did nasty things for money, Delilah, she cut off his hair. That was the source of his strength, or so he believed. Of course, God alone is the source of our strength. Then the Philistine, the bad guys, poked out his eyes. At a gathering of their leaders, they stood him before them, chained to two pillars. They mocked and laughed at him. Then, muttering a prayer, let me die with the Philistines. He pushed with all his might against those pillars, and down came the building, killing all the people in it. Scripture says that Samson killed many more when he died than while he lived. By the end of the book of Judges, Israel has been ruled by judges for 200 years. The last two are Eli and Samuel, whose stories are told not in Judges, but in 1 Samuel. Eli, the 14th judge of Israel, was the high priest at Shiloh, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. A woman named Hannah could not bear a child. In the temple one day, in bitterness of soul and while weeping, she cried out to the Lord. She promised God that should he grant her wish to give birth to a son, she would dedicate him to serve the Lord all his life. The priest Eli witnessed this and initially accused her of being drunk. Hannah protested her innocence, and Eli told her, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked of him. And the God of Israel did indeed grant Hannah what she asked of him. In the course of time, the Bible says, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel. When spoken aloud in Hebrew, Samuel sounds like requested of God. Hannah was telling us, I named him requested of God because I asked the Lord for him. When she had weaned him, she took him with her to Shiloh, as well as a three-year-old bull, half a bushel of flour, and a jar of wine. Though the boy was still young, he took him to the Lord's house at Shiloh. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the boy to Eli. Please, Lord, she said, as sure as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this boy, and since the Lord gave me what I asked him for, I now give the boy to the Lord. For as long as he lives, he is given to the Lord." And so Samuel, who would one day become the 15th and the last judge of Israel, was raised from childhood by Eli in the tabernacle. The boy Samuel served in the Lord's presence and wore a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife. May the Lord give you children by this woman in place of the one she has given to the Lord. Then they would go home. The Lord paid attention to Hannah's need, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. God blessed Hannah for her sacrifice, giving her three sons for the one she dedicated to the Lord, plus two daughters as a bonus. There is a lesson here for us. It's been said many different ways, but I think the simplest and clearest is this. You cannot outgive God. Hannah gave up what she wanted most, her son, whom she had requested of God. She presented him to the Lord as a sacrificial gift. God blessed her with three more boys and two girls. This illustrates the kind of sacrifice that we should be making to God. Some of us consider it a great sacrifice just getting out of bed on Sunday morning to attend church or to give up Wednesday evening for choir practice or Tuesday nights for prayer meeting. 
Do your gifts cost you little? Or are they gifts of sacrifice? Are you presenting God with tokens? Or are you presenting him with your life, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him? Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Eli was given charge of raising Samuel, but he wasn't much of a father to his own kids. In contrast to Samuel, who was kept busy properly ministering before the Lord, the sons of the priests of Eli were doing whatever they pleased. Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord or for the priest's share of the sacrifices from the people. When anyone offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come with a three-pronged meat fork while the meat was boiling and plunge it into the container or kettle or cauldron or cooking pot. The priest would claim for himself whatever the meat fork brought up. This is the way they treated the Israelites who came there to Shiloh. Eli's sons behaved like greedy pigs, and they showed disrespect for God's law. Even before the fat was burned, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, Give the priest some meat to roast, because he won't accept boiled meat from you, only raw. If that man said to him, The fat must be burned first, then you can take whatever you want for yourself, the servant would reply, no, I insist that you hand it over right now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. So the servant's sin was very severe in the presence of the Lord because they treated the Lord's offering with contempt. When Eli failed to rein in the abusive behavior of his sons, God promised to punish his family. Eventually, it ended in the death of Eli and his sons. As for Samuel, the future 15th and last judge of the Israelites, Everything about his life demonstrates the grace of God. From Samuel, we observe how God works in our lives. For example, consider how Samuel was called. The boy Samuel served the Lord in Eli's presence. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare and prophetic visions were not widespread. One day, Eli, whose eyesight was failing, was lying in his room. Before the lamp of God had gone out, Samuel was lying down in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was located. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. I didn't call, Eli replied. Go back and lay down. So he went and lay down. Once again, the Lord called Samuel. Samuel got up, went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. I didn't call you my son, he replied. Go back and lie down. In ancient Bible times, God spoke audibly to Abraham, to Moses, the prophets, and many others. And he spoke to Joshua before completing the conquest of the promised land. One powerful way God spoke in the Old Testament was through this audible voice of his. And there's no biblical account that proves God has ever stopped speaking in this way audibly. When Jesus was baptized, no one questioned who said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The Apostle John once wrote, I heard a loud voice behind me, like a trumpet, saying, Write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches. During the years of the judges, however, God speaking audibly had become a rare event. For a human to hear the voice of God was no more common in Samuel's day than it is in our own. However, with God, all things are possible. Now Samuel had not yet experienced the Lord because the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Once again, for the third time, the Lord called Samuel. He got up, went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli understood that the Lord was calling the boy. He told Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came, stood there, and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel responded, speak, for your servant is listening. Some people never communicate with God. Many aren't believers, of course, no surprise they aren't talking to God. But even some Christians spend little time communicating with our Lord. Many churches no longer emphasize prayer. 
I grew up with a traditional Wednesday night prayer meeting, though we didn't always go. I've attended deacon meetings where, at the end of our time together, we break into prayer groups to ask God to bless our decisions and the things we plan to do. Deacons should be doing the opposite, praying first to ask God to guide us in our decisions and in determining the things we should do, not just bless our efforts in doing that which we think is best. Expressing yourself to God is what we call prayer, but it's only part of it. Listening to God is the more important part. God may never use an audible voice to communicate with you, but he speaks clearly in other ways. While reading the Bible, God often implants his will within us. The Holy Spirit is there to impress upon our spirit his guidance. That's listening to the still small voice within you. And yes, you might even hear God communicating to you, listening to a sermon. Sometimes we preachers get it right. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Whether you realize it or not, as a believer, you are in constant communication with God. The next time a good idea pops into your head, try this. Say, thank you, Lord. If it truly is a good idea, chances are God placed it there between your ears. And every good idea from God comes with this stamp, ASAP. He wants you to act on the good idea he's given you just as soon as is possible. Failing to act quickly, that is, to delay doing something God wants us to do, opens the possibility of missing out on meeting someone else's need, or missing a critical connection with someone who is important to you, or failing to give a timely, positive, and uplifting word of encouragement to someone you love. When you delay, you may miss an opportunity to serve the Lord in some unique way. And that is why we Christians often fail to do the very thing God has called us to do. We put it off. We delay. We miss the ASAP part of God's good idea. I know I've blown it many times. But as I've matured in the Lord, as I've grown closer to him and have become more familiar with his ways, I'm more sensitive to his directing my steps. Perhaps you've found that you tend to act more swiftly now than you did when you were younger. I hope so. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. So pick up the phone and make that call when the Holy Spirit nudges you. Write that note of encouragement. Drop in and see that friend you haven't visited for a while, the one who suddenly popped into your thoughts. God is directing you to someone who needs what you have, so don't delay. When you sense God is calling you, wherever you are, stop what you're doing and say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Bible scholars estimate Samuel was just three years old when Hannah took him to the house of the Lord because it was just after he had been weaned. Can you imagine the troubles, concerns, and worries of this little boy? Doesn't mother love me? I miss my daddy. This tabernacle is cold and drafty. And who is his grumpy old grandpa Eli? I want to go home. To be sent away so soon from his father's house, away from his mom and dad, Surely it must have been very hard on young Samuel. And you think you've got troubles. But have you noticed, God looks with special love upon the seemingly unloved, the insignificant ones whose own family may reject them. Joseph was hated by his brothers and sold into slavery. God made him a ruler of a nation. David was considered of zero value to his older brothers. He brought them lunch on the battlefield and they sneered at him, told him to go home and babysit the sheep. <laughs> well, then he slew the giant's Goliath with a slingshot. Mary Magdalene was just another girl amongst the disciples. Jesus had driven seven demons out of her. She was less than insignificant. Yet three days after his death, to whom does Christ appear? to Mary Magdalene. And then what does this insignificant one do? She runs to tell the disciples that the Lord has risen. The risen king of kings spoke first to insignificant Mary Magdalene. God's delight is to use the least among us to accomplish his purposes. In our Savior's eyes, no one is insignificant. And that's why Yahweh calls your name in the middle of the night. I trust that you never become like the Dead Sea. That's the sea of death. I've seen it. I've soaked in it. 
That body of water is no good for bathing. You literally have to wash yourself after you swim in it. And you can't really swim in it. You more or less just float on top of it. It's thick with salt. The Dead Sea lies at the bottom of the Jordan River. It perpetually drinks in Jordan's water. It takes it in, but it never lets it out. It's a dead end, you see, the Dead Sea. I hope you never become like the Dead Sea. The springs of living water flow in you. You must let it flow out and share it with others or else you become dead. See? We Christians are not to be receivers only, taking in the water of life and not letting it out. We are to pour out goodness into others as fast as our God pours it into us. When Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene, she ran to the disciples as fast as she could to tell them that the Lord has risen. Who have you told? Who have you run to as fast as you can to share the good news that Jesus has risen from the grave? Perhaps you are insignificant, but if so, you remain insignificant by choice. You choose to stay unimportant to the cause of Christ. But here's the good news. You can change your mind. Begin today to listen to God and to act immediately to do the things he asks of you. In your heart, in your mind, just say, Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. I'm Rich Musler, Christian author and pastor of a very small church in Louisville, Texas. Thanks for studying God's Word with me today. Lord willing, I'll see you next week.